Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the ninth day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. And uh, we're going to look at the scriptures first. A interesting story showed up on the uh, X or Twitter account. It's sort of awkward. <laughs> Come on, make up your mind what it's going to be called. Um, of the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. Interesting story. Uh, what? 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 All right. Uh, this has to do with so-called Christianity. Definitely. And I want to look at some scripture that's relevant to this story. It's first starting out with something that has to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. And since I noticed my subscribers are increasing, and some of them, because of what I've been looking at lately, uh, probably aren't Christians, I'm going to expand the context a little bit here. Uh, because some people aren't familiar with this text. They should be. So let's go over to the scriptures. Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, in other words, before they sexually came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make, a, uh, make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. In other words, to secretly divorce her rather than to publicly shame her and subject her to the possible punishments of adultery. So, obviously, she became pregnant, and he's like, hmm, <laughs> what's happened here? Uh, but he didn't, you know, rather than, than uh, he wanted to let's deal with this quietly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take uh, to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus, or Yeshua, means God saves, or God is our salvation. So all these things that were done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her sexually till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. All right, the point I want to point out here you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. From their sins. Let me uh, take a look at that really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Separate them from their sins. Save them away from their sins. Apo. All right, from their sins. He shall save his, doesn't say he shall save his people in their sins, but from their sins. There's a difference, right? He does, just doesn't whitewash us and leave us as vile sinners, slaves of sin. But his, the purpose of God is to actually deliver us from sin, to not only separate us from the punishment of sin, but to separate us from the bondage of sin. So we don't have to sin anymore. Now, I realize that Judaism, neither Judaism nor Islam, has a, a good understanding of the concept of the fall. And the fact that we are all born, a born separated from God, not what we're supposed to be. And because of that separation, we're self-centered and we act that way. And therefore, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Way too often, even those who have been born again, who are genuine Christians, 
sin still dwells in these mortal bodies while we're in these physical bodies, and we still sin, but we don't practice sin. We don't seek it. It still overcomes us once in a while, sneaks up on us, and our what we inherit from Adam, our natural humanity, uh, we might have a fit of temper now and then or you know, yell at our wife or something like that, but we don't uh, live sinful lifestyles. If, you are, if you're living a sinful lifestyle, you're not a Christian, period. I don't care what you, 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 you can be baptized three times. You can be baptized a hundred times. You can go commu- to communion three times a day. But if you're living a sinful lifestyle, you haven't been saved. You're not truly a Christian. God has, you're not, you haven't been born again. You're not regenerate. God hasn't given you a new heart on which he has written his laws. You're not seeking to do his will. You're seeking to do your own will. That's, that's evidence that you're not truly a Christian, because a Christian is a person who has been born again, who has been made a new creature in Christ, and the promises of that include the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, forgiveness of your sins, uh, being given a new heart and a new spirit, the heart of stone being removed out of you, and God writing his commandments, his laws upon your heart. Rather than an external code, it's inside. In fact, Christ himself is our law. Christ himself dwells in us through his spirit. And he is the one, he is our Lord. He's the one that rules over us. He's the one that if we do wrong, he will discipline us. But we are his children. We are the children of God. We are not what we were. That doesn't mean in this life we're not perfect. Still live in this shell that is in which sin still dwells, but we do not live a lifestyle that is consistent with being wicked. You know, an uh, obvious lifestyle. We're not thieves. We're not murderers. We're not liars. We're not swindlers. We'll look at the list. But these are all lifestyles that people live. Uh, when a Christian sins, it's inconsistent with who we are. When a sinful person sins, it's consistent with who they are. But the Holy God, God sent his son to save us from the bondage of sin, to save us from being that, to save us from our sins, not in our sins. I think people can understand that. I hope some Christians don't like that idea. Well, if they don't like it, it's because they're still in their sins. They they want to, be, to go to heaven. They want... Uh, uh, to be blessed, they, they want to, you know, but they don't want Christ to rule over them. They love their sin. They haven't been saved. I don't care what they've done, whatever. Again, they can be bat- triple immersed. It doesn't matter. If you still are living a sinful lifestyle, you're not saved. You need to repent and cry out to God to save you in truth. People get baptized for all kinds of reasons. Water does not save you. Christ saves you. It's, it, you, it's a work of God. Salvation is the work of God, indeed. So let's go to the story I'm referring to here. It's a little bit odd. There's a lot of odd in this world, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, which has gotten weirder and weirder. Um, I mean, again, I'm old enough to have observed this over my lifetime, and the, the, my wife's family was Roman Catholic, so I'm not unfamiliar with it. I lived in the Rio Grande Valley, which is Roman Catholic, uh, more Roman Catholic than the, the Catholicism in south of the border is not like the Catholicism in the United States, because up here, they have to compete with the other churches, so they're not quite as Roman Catholic as they are in Mexico, for example. Uh, they, they have to be a little more, they have to mind their manners a little bit more and be not quite so idolatrous and outrageous. And by the way, if any Muslims are out there uh, watching this, this Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. Real Christians do not worship idols. We don't. It's forbidden in the New Testament. Did you know that? Did you know that? In fact, why don't I look that up? Um uh, it's in uh, the book called uh, the First Epistle of John. Let me, I got to correct that search. And uh, I'll bring it up on the screen here for you real soon, because I, I want Muslims to know what real Christianity is. I want you to know Jesus Christ, whom you recognize as a prophet. You call him Isa, I believe. 
I want you to, to know what we really believe, real Christians believe about him and what he really is. So First John. See, at, at the end, in fact, it's the very last bo- uh, verse in the epistle to John called First John, the, the letter of John. Epistle is just a fancy word for letter. Uh, this is another reason I shouldn't use the King James because... I think I need to talk to Muslims and to Jews and to others. I've spent so much time uh, dealing with Christians that uh, God is concerned about everybody. And there's over a billion and a half Muslims out there, only a tiny number of Jews. But God cares. God sent his son to die for your sins. And there is atonement for your sins, forgiveness for all your sins in Jesus Christ. And that should be that the gospel, it's a word that means good news, good news. But it's more than that. But I'm not going to get into that now. It's, it's, a, it's a special word. It has to do with the, the good news of victory. What's the victory? Over the curse of sin and death. That's the victory. That's in Christ Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. Who's his people? All who trust in him. He will save you from his sins, your sins. And the penalty of your sins. So let's go to, let's see, where is it? Here, verse 21, right at the top of the screen there, little children. This is the Apostle John. Uh, He was the last living apostle when he wrote this, probably. And he was the youngest of them when Jesus called him. He was uh, the brother of James. They were both professional fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, the, the Lake of Tiberias in the Galilee. So little children, referring to Christians, little children, guard yourself from idols, idols. And Roman Catholicism loves idols, images. An idol is an image. An idol, uh, uh, Muslims know this very well. Idols, uh, let me adjust something here. The word is idolon or idolon, idolon. An image. Yep, an image. It doesn't have to be of a heathen god. It says, by implication, a heathen god. No, it's an image of that. A, an image of God. An, an attempt to make the image of the real God is an idol because it never represents God as He truly is. Only God represents God as He truly is. Jesus is the true image of God because He is God. Uh, he has to be, and, and Muslims will understand this, that anything less than God, any image that is less than God himself, can't represent God. But God himself becoming man, made in the image of God, cr- God created man in his own image, does represent God because he is God. It's a difficult concept, but the scripture, God has revealed it, uh, it the the, the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary, even though we struggle with it, because the scriptures, God's revelation requires it. Even the Quran, Allah uses the plural we, referring to himself very often, does he not? (laughs) So, uh, let's go to the story. Now, (laughs) just so you know, even though... um, Roman Catholicism is the largest denomination of so-called Christians in the world. The, uh, no, it's not Christian. It's a perversion of Christianity. So this is BBC News. This again, this popped up on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the title of this is, uh, this is, Transgender People Can Be Baptized and Be Godparents, Vatican Says. Well, the Vatican does not represent Jesus Christ. In fact, this man here, the Pope, is um, what they call him a vicar of Christ. The word vicar means substitute for. Now, there's there's a word in Greek that if you were to translate substitute for Christ into Greek, it would be antichristos, antichrist. Did you know that? Well, you do now. The word ante can mean both a substitute for or 
in opposition to. And this man is definitely in opposition to Christ also, since he had the chutzpah to change the Lord's Prayer, change the very words of Jesus Christ because he didn't like it. He didn't like it. So this man thinks he is above God, superior to Christ himself. That makes him a definite antichrist, one who sets himself above God. Oh, that not that a lovely place? Doesn't make that uh, make you want to just run up and kiss this man? <laughs> Yikes! This is uh, this is from Reuters. The picture there, at least, probably the news story is from Reuters. Transgender in, ca in caps here. Transgender people can be baptized in the Catholic Church as long as doing so does not cause scandal or confusion. The Vatican has announced. So, so uh, see, in Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, water baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation. In fact, you're born again by getting sprinkled by a priest. This is not Christianity. This is man-made religion. This is not biblical Christianity. Uh, whether you don't, water has nothing to do with salvation. It's only a symbol of it. It's, it c comes from Jewish tradition, in fact, and a little bit from the Old Testament law. It comes from the uh, Jewish tradition of what was practiced when a when a Gentile became a Jew, conversion. So it was a symbol of that. It is not required for salvation. Faith is required for salvation. Confessing Christ is required for salvation. In other words, uh, you're you're openly identifying yourself with Him, and this is usually done. Baptism is usually done in the presence of a congregation. Now, it doesn't have to be another person. You can't baptize yourself. You have to be baptized by a Christian. But again, the water does not cause salvation. Uh, what happen, When you're born again, when, when, when God saves you, you want to identify with his people and publicly acknowledge him um, or acknowledge him in the community of Christians so you, they know that you have joined them. Obviously, in certain circumstances, like in Islamic countries, if you're a Muslim, you may not want to be too open about that. Uh, God probably will permit some, in, a, in other words, to, to confess him before a man. But if somebody says, are you a Christian, you can't deny it. At that point, you know, you can, you can try to avoid the question, you, you know, but when the situation comes up and you're called on to identify yourself one way or the other, you can't deny Christ. You have to confess, yes, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Other, he, he's, Jesus said, if you, those who confess me before men, I will confess before my angels in heaven, or the angels of my Father in heaven. So, and those who deny me among before men, I will deny before them. In other words, they're not mine. There is a price that we sometimes have to pay, often have to pay, to be a follower of Christ. There is a price. It can, the circumstances can, and I would say in your lifetime, they will come up one way or another. And sometimes it is, uh, you have to be wet, ready to, to lay it all down on the line. Transgender people can be baptized in the Catholic Church as long as doing so does not cause scandal or confusion, the Vatican announced. Oh, as long as it doesn't upset people. It's so, but again, under Roman Catholic doctrine, baptism is, is necessary to be saved at all. Water baptism. Technically, it doesn't have to be by a priest. In an emergency, you know, as long as you use the right formula which is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the, the baptismal formula. Um, I, I alter that myself a little bit. I baptize you into Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because the actual formula is, it's, it's, it's we're told to baptize in his name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But, and, but it's baptized into Christ. So, it the, the the name the names are the are the authority of God, one God, that reveals Himself as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not three gods, not three gods, one God. 
So, but the uh, that's that's one of the scriptures that indicates what we probably improperly call the doctrine of the Trinity: one God in three persons. And I really don't like using the word persons, but I don't have a better word. We we as Christians struggle with the concept how to express it, how to understand it ourselves, because we're talking about the very nature of God, and we can't know that unless God reveals it, and He has revealed. The, the fact that he there's one God, that's that we started at the beginning, one God, there's only one God. But he's, as in the Quran, he speaks sometimes of himself in a plurality, but one God. And, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, there's one God, and there, but there's not three separate persons in God. There's one God, one nature, one being, but there's the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Father, the Son is referred to as the Word, the Lagos, before the Incarnation in particular. The, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word is God. He came, became flesh and dwelt among us. And He's not a created being. He's eternal because God is eternal. They're, they're not separate. He's not a creature. There are some people that call themselves Christians that, like Jehovah's Witnesses, that say he's a creature. No, he's not. He is the creator. In one way, you could almost say that he's the face of God. He's God the, as the word. He's God's expression. He is the expression of God. He is God self expressing himself to creation, to, to human beings, to angels, to all things. He is, that's why the, he's the image. He's, he's what He's the, he's the communication between God and man. He's the connection between God and man and God and creation, both as the creator and because he has entered into creation himself as a man. Now, men were supposed to have dominion over creation, and he has dominion. So it's uh, it all fits together, but trying to express it in a simple way is, well, you can't always do that. So the church's doctrinal office, that used to be called the Office of the Inquisition, also said trans people can be godparents at a baptism and witnesses at a wedding. How so? Now, I think, the, don't the witnesses at a, at a, at a, well, uh, at a baptism? Absolutely not. Because godparents, which is not really a biblical concept, but uh, particularly, it's not a biblical doctrine. What godparents is parent, uh, her parents are, and other church denominations do this too, not all. Uh, so that they baptize infants, which isn't biblical. So Baptists don't have godparents. <laughs> but I was raised as a Lutheran, which is a type of Reformed Roman Catholic. <laughs> and some are less Reformed than others. But uh, so... Godparents are friends or relatives, close friends or relatives, that what, what it is is when a child is baptized, an infant is baptized, uh, what they are are people that are committing themselves in the sight of the, of the congregation of the church. That, and this actually should be a legal thing too, but it's not that they, in, in the event of the death of the parents or some other reason that causes the parents to be unable to raise the child, that they will take responsibility and raise their, the child themselves in the faith. And uh, also they're supposed to ensure, <laughs> help ensure that that takes place. So th they will actually take, the, supposed to take the child in their own house and raise them as one of their own children. Uh, it's uh, that's what a godparent is supposed to be. So how can you have a trans do that? Because trans is trans pe people that are in that lifestyle, that continue in that lifestyle, are not Christians at all. And I'll show you that from the scripture. So th this is this is a lifestyle. It's not like the color of your skin, which is not an issue among Christians, by the way, or among Muslims. It's not an issue. You know, we're, we're, uh, uh, Islam is a universal religion like Christianity is. Judaism isn't. Judaism is not a universal religion. It's for a particular people. Uh, and Judaism, 
Well, that's not that Judaism as in rabbinical Judaism is man-made. Uh, the, the Judaism of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the covenant of Moses was for a particular nation for a particular length of time until Messiah would come. And then that terminates. Messiah came. Even if they didn't receive him, most of them, he still came. And the covenant of the law is gone, and that's why God removed the temple. It's no more because it's obsolete. It has no function. And God will not accept any offerings made under the covenant of Moses or a temple built under the covenant of Moses. It would be an abomination because what God planned was it to be temporary until Messiah came and brought in the new covenant, the eternal covenant that was made when he died on the cross. His blood is the blood of that covenant. So the move follows attempts by Pope Francis to make the church more welcoming to LGBTQ people. Well, the church should be welcoming to LGBTQ people that want to be delivered from their sin and bondage and made new in Christ, delivered from slavery to a sinful lifestyle. And it is a sinful, it's an immoral lifestyle. Now, any Muslims out there, you know this. There's nothing odd about this. What's odd is that a person that claims to be the, the head of the universal church, the bishop of every baptized person, makes anti-Christ statements like this. He is he's not a representative of Christ at all. He's an enemy of Jesus Christ. Do not, do not take this as Christianity. This is not Christianity at all. Not at all. This system I'm not condemning Roman Catholics as persons, but the system is a corruption of Christianity, and the papacy is an anti-Christ thing. It is, it is opposing the authority of Christ, especially in examples like this where they set themselves above Jesus Christ himself and God's revelation, above the apostles, above everything which fulfills the description of the man of sin, an antichrist. They're not the only ones. <laughs> it's just, this is something people do. Uh, so, yeah, was, you know, when I was serving as a pastor, if, if a LGBTQ person came, again, the, the, causing a scandal in the church, that gets into a little bit of a problem. But as far as Welcoming a person to come and listen to the gospel, yes. A person that, that repenting is not repenting of your sins, per se. It's repenting of your, of a, it's a change of mind, a change of attitude. So if, when a person, is a, a sinful person, which is everybody, uh, you, we all come that way. There's a song, a popular song, that's just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me. We don't make ourselves holy to come to God. We come to God that he might make us holy. That, that work of cleansing us is his work. We can't do it. But we do have to come to him willing to, uh, to cast ourselves upon him and willing to let him change us, let him set us free from our sins. If we desire to cling to our sins, are unwilling to let him separate us from our sins, then we're, we can't become Christians because we don't trust him. We are not trusting, entrusting ourselves. Co becoming, coming to Christ involves entrusting yourself into the hands of God, into the hands of Christ. It is not simply something you do. Uh, you, you have to trust him to do what he's promised to do. So faith, uh, Abraham believed God, and because he believed God, God's promise, that was counted by God uh, as, as being right in his sight, righteousness in the sight of God. So uh, Abraham was accepted to God, not because of Abraham's works, but because Abraham trusted God. The Pope told one trans person in July that even if we uh, are sinners, 
he, God, draws near to help us. Okay. I don't have a problem with that statement. That is true, because if God doesn't help us, we would never really come to him. It is God who has to draw us. It is God who has to convict us of our sinfulness. But if God is working within us to draw us to him, we will recognize our sin, and we will want to be free of our sin. The Holy Spirit will show us our sin, not just the things we've done, but what we are. See, it's what we are is the real problem, not just what we've done. What we are as sinful human beings is what produces the sinful deeds. We need to be changed. We need, we need God to save us from ourselves. That is the issue. Uh, the Vatican's updated stance. <laughs> now, the Roman Catholic Church has this statement that the church never changes. They never change their doctrine. It's always the same. <laughs> Some people lie to themselves. Yes, it's like looking at some of the propaganda on Twitter. It's like, really? You expect, what are we, a bunch of idiots? Do you think we're going to believe this? Uh, the Vatican's updated stance comes after the Brazilian bishops, Jose um, Negri, yeah, that's Portuguese, I probably got it wrong, wrote to the church, uh, the costery of the doctrine of the faith, uh, the, the Institute of the Doctrine of the Faith, it used to be called the Inquisition, with six questions regarding LGBT people and their participation in baptism and matrimony. On Wednesday, we're going to look at what God says about this through his apostles, not this so-called guy that thinks he's the apostle. No, he's not. Uh, on Wednesday, the department posted on its website, again, this was the Inquisition, Department of the Inquisition, and I wonder, you all know what that was, right? Evidence. It's like, well, look at what Israel's doing in, in the Gaza, and that's the kind of stuff the Department of the Inquisition used to do. You know, massacred people. Had a dungeon. Dungeons underneath the, uh, the Vatican were filled with captives being tortured and everything else. The, back in the 1800s, the French came down there and conquered uh, the uh, Rome and liberated all the prisoners of the Pope. <sighs> oh, that's part of the history that's not often reported. Uh, it's not a Christian institution. Do not think that Roman Catholicism, especially the institution in, in the Vatican, uh, represents Christianity at all. They are enemies of Christianity. There, there are reasons why people don't believe in Christ is because they see this fraud, this counterfeit system that's really created by Satan, uh, to to besmirch the name of Christ. It's a false, uh, it's something to camouflage the gospel, to prevent people from coming to it. It is not to cause them to come to it. <laughs> it's slander. Roman Catholicism slanders the name of Christ. The system does, not necessarily Catholics. There are people that are devoted to Christ and they trust in him and in all kinds of places that maybe they shouldn't be, but they're there. Okay, so the uh, Argentine Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, with the approval of Pope Francis, posted. Okay, so he's, well, Francis is from Argentina, too. It states that the transgender person, including those who have undergone uh, gone hormonal treatment and gender reassignment surgery, now uh, sh can receive baptism under the same conditions as other believers if there are no situations in which it would, the, uh, there would be a risk of generating public scandal or disorientation among the faithful. Ah! In other words, you can be saved as long as you don't create a scandal. No, water baptism can't save you at all. And becoming part of the Catholic Church is something Mr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson, his wife, uh, Jordan Peterson's wife, is converting to Catholicism, and he, he approves of it. You're foolish. You don't know what you're doing. Uh, Peterson's a new believer. Jordan Peterson, well, he claims to be a Christian now, um, new believer, sort of. He is not a reliable guide. He's not mature in the faith. He doesn't know enough. He's still filled with his psychology. Do not follow Peterson as a guide to what a Christian is. 
Hopefully he'll become one or become a better one. Uh, but yes, he doesn't know enough yet to be somebody. You're, you're following a child as far as Christianity goes, a little child. Uh, somebody that's only been a Christian a year or two is, no. Do not follow them. Celebrities, especially. Somebody comes out as a Christian, famous rock singer or rap uh, artist or golf player or whatever, and proclaims himself to become a Christian. Well, that's wonderful, but just don't follow them. <laughs> They're not mature yet. You just see if they, you know, after 10 years, for example, if they're still a professing vocal Christian and are teaching things consistent with the Scripture, then, yeah, but not. You know, um, novices in the faith are not supposed to be teachers uh, or deacons or elders in the church. And I'm sure a lot of you out there can understand that in your own, whatever you are currently. Uh, like Muslims, I'm sure you have something similar. Same Jews, too. I mean, there's, uh, there's a whole lot of similarity in some ways between Judaism and Christianity, but, well, uh, all the early Christians were Jews. The early Christians were Jews that accepted Jesus as opposed to the Pharisees who mostly rejected him. So you had this split between those who actually followed God and those decided not to. The Pharisees, generally. And the worshipers in the temple, well, the temple was taken down. So they, uh, uh, the Sadducees were the associated with the temple. God removed the temple. Yes, it's, he's not going to, he's not going to cause it to be rebuilt. It would be disobedience to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount on Alaska Mount. However, God says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. Now, currently, Christians aren't allowed to pray on the Temple Mount, which is a little bit inconsistent because uh, Islam insists that they worship the same God Christians do, the one God, because there's only one God. You could, if you're worshiping the true God, you're worshiping the same God, right? There's only one. There's only one true God. So, why would Islam not want Christians to worship the one true God on the Temple Mount? I mean, real Christians. I could see not allowing the Pope up there, but he was actually allowed up there, wasn't he? I don't know if it was this one or the previous one. I know there was photographs of that. I've been on the Temple Mount. I know I, know I got a finger waved at me uh, by uh, security up there uh, because I opened a New Testament, I believe. Now, how would you tell if I'm praying anyway? You, you wouldn't know. Probably. It's a matter of internal communication. Although I usually speak out loud when I pray. But I don't pray in the presence of other people normally. Except for public worship. And then I'm... Don't say amen unless I agree with what they say. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, six questions. Uh, it states that the transgender person, those who have, uh, have undergone hormonal treatment and gender reassignment, can receive baptism under the same condition as other believers. Okay, the if condition is like, really? This is nonsense. As a, a person who has been a pastor and as a person who is a born-again Christian that actually is qualified to serve as a pastor, if I, I was asked by God to do so, um, there are qualifications, <laughs> biblical qualifications. It has nothing to do with education, just you have to be knowledgeable about, you have to be able to teach, uh, and you have to be a good character, 
acceptably good, not perfect, but good. You can't be a scandal. Yeah, uh, you can't be a person that practices sin. You can't be a. You cannot. You have to be the the husband of one wife. You know, in other words, not divorced, not remarried. I should say, not remarried, uh, not having uh, uh, mistresses on the side, things like that. Uh, obviously, or should be obvious. I I shouldn't use that word when I'm looking at something that comes from the Pope. Um, so, can I let me answer the question? Can a transgender person, as a person, it, so this is something that could have, well, probably a few years ago, this would be less likely to come up. But say at the church I was past, one of the churches I was pastoring at, if somebody who was living in a transgender lifestyle or had been living in that uh, came to faith in Christ, genuine faith in Christ, um, and wanted to be baptized, first of all, if they had, they wouldn't be dressed as a transgender person. They would not come to church, say a large man would not come to church carrying a little pink purse uh, with ribbons in his hair and wearing a skirt if he had actually was intending to come to Christ because these are not something you're born with. This is not something you have to do. What clothes you choose to put on is obviously a matter of will. It is a moral issue, not a physical impediment. If you have received hormonal treatment, which will wear off, it's not permanent, and surgery, and if you actually come to Christ in faith and sincerely desire to follow him, in faith and obedience, I don't say you, you have to be following, you must desire that. Yes, I would baptize you, but you can't show up in your transgender regalia. I mean, you have to stop that because this is a lifestyle, it is an action. It's just like a person came that say they were uh, especially something like this, uh, uh, drug addicts, are they got a little bit I other issues they have to deal with. But still, I mean, uh, the intention has to be there, and you have to manifest something that is reasonably consistent with the in intention. Some of the life, all these things have uh, bondage, uh, habits, and other thing else that, that affects us and temptations. But if your intention is to live as a Christian, to commit yourself to Christ, to, to live in obedience to him, intentional, you know, the intention of it, uh, not the fulfillment of it, but the intention to, to put yourself in his hands. And again, we all come as sinners. He is the one who cleans us up and sets us free from the bondage of sin. So yes, I would, uh, you know, the fact that you had cosmetic surgery or chemical hormonal treatments doesn't bar you from the kingdom of God. It is, but if you continue in that lifestyle, that does. You, uh, there is, you cannot intend to continue to, to live in opposition to God's order and certain Sexual practices and lifestyles are contrary to God's created, created purpose. For thousands and thousands of years, this has been considered sinful in most cultures, except the debased cultures, like certain periods of time in Greece and others, uh, which were not a standard of, you know, it's, it's not simply a cultural thing, though, because God word explicit, God's word explicitly says things like this. In fact, cross-dressing is ex ex uh, explicitly prohibited in, in the law of Moses. Again, we're not under the law of Moses, but uh, that still is a, a source of what God considers right and wrong. We're not subject to the curse of the law as Christians, but still there is a revelation of God's just, just uh, justice and his view on things about what's right and wrong. So you can't simply... Th uh, thumb your nose at things that are moral things that are that are like uh, sexual issues are grounded in God's creative purposes too. Why are uh, human beings? 
Why do we, why are we sexual at all? Well, be, to procreate. That's the basic intent, plus, plus uh, uh, special, the, the relationship of a man and a woman in marriage. It is meant for that, too, for mutual uh, intimacy and to, to, to bond together in a very special way. The two shall become one flesh. That is part of God's purpose in marriage. But it's supposed to be in marriage between a man and a woman. Only that is marriage. And the marriage is a covenant not only between a man and a woman, man, uh, but also between God. He is the third party. So, especially a Christian marriage, you don't, you don't marry a Christian and a non-believer. The Bible warns against that because there won't be harmony in the marriage. There'll be this, you know, one person belongs to the devil and the other person belongs to Christ, and that's not going to work out very well. It's to be, we're told not to do that, not to be unequally yoked, and marriage is a, is a bonding, a yoke, fasting together of a uh, believer with a non-believer. Judaism believes that, and so does Islam, too, <laughs> at least. can be understandable. It's not a matter of, of hatred or uh, opposition to others. It's a matter of practicality in a lot of ways. There's not going to be peace in a situation like that. That's why we're told not to do it. It stays, okay, uh, yes, yeah, so if a transgender person has the repentance of a changed attitude toward God and a changed attitude toward sin, in other words, they're rejecting their former lifestyle and want to be become a follower of Christ, want to belong to him. That, that, is, that is what repentance is, that change in attitude, that change in mind. Uh, and that is all that's required. So if you want to persist in sin, you, you want to remain a rebel, you, you hate God, but you want to be baptized, no. <laughs> yeah, what would be the point? What would be the point? You're confessing Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, in other words, the authority over your life. Uh, so it goes on here, the story, Pope suggests church can bless same-sex couples. Absolutely not. See, this is different. Uh, allowing a person that has been transgender, a practitioner of the transgender lifestyle, to become baptized on the assumption is that they've changed their attitude toward that and want to become a Christian, which, which is not practicing those things. Christians can't practice that kind of thing as a lifestyle, especially. Now, if a, if a, if a transgender person, say in a moment of temptation or for a little while, fell back into that lifestyle and then came back, you know, that doesn't mean they, they're not a Christian. It means they fell to temptation uh, and fell into temptation for, you know, things like that can happen. We have our ups and downs, let's put it that way. Uh, and we all do sin, but to live it as a continuing lifestyle, no, you can't remain in that lifestyle. Again, people that they may have temptations now and then and fail now and then, but that is not the same as living a lifestyle, especially where you are embracing that lifestyle and endorsing that lifestyle and advocating that lifestyle. No, you can't do that. At that point, if a person does that, even if they're baptized, it indicates they never have had true faith in Christ and they're not a Christian. Uh, so the... Uh, so the Pope suggests that uh, the Church can bless same-sex couples. The Pope and senior Protestants denounce anti-gay laws. I got to take a look at that one for a second here and see uh, what who the senior Protestants are. Probably Anglicans. Archbishop of Canterbury. Ah, really. Yeah, I sort of was suspecting that. He is no more a Christian than the Pope Francis is, which is not. Um, the Church of Scotland, they're not Christians either. The, the, the church system is not Christian. No, nor are these heads, because they are not 
They do not teach what Jesus Christ taught. They do not follow him. So therefore, they're unbelievers, or actually they're enemies of God because they are pretending to be leaders in the church when they're actually enemies of Christ himself. They don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, so anti-gay laws, it depends what those are. I do not believe that, Christ, that countries that confess Christianity or are Christian, because there's a lot of Christians live there, should pass laws that say sentence LGBTQs to death. Uh, but I would say the uh, well, they're, they're passing laws in Russia like this too, which I which I approve of, where you prohibit uh, attempts to evangelize, uh, to draw others into that lifestyle, or you you practice public displays of that kind of sexual deviation uh, in, in the presence of others, so, or deliberately in the presence of others. So, the, or like for example, example uh, say drag queens doing book readings for children in the public library definitely should be prohibited. It should not be tolerated. That stuff, because it is corrosive to culture, to human culture, period. Uh, any kind of culture starts embracing this, they're finished. This is one of the marks of the death knells of society. The embracing of homosexuality and sexual perversion, that's the end of the society right there. Should they be put to death? Absolutely not. No, no, I don't believe that at all. Uh, we're under the new covenant. Uh, God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. So if you look at that, God doesn't want people to be killed because, hey, that's it. I... Uh, you have forfeited, you, you, if you don't come to repentance you, and you die in your sins, well, then you'll be judged in your sins. Judged as for not accepting him, not accepting Christ. That's a damning sin, really, is a refusal to believe the gospel. It is not the things you've done. It's the refusal to come to him and be forgiven and be set free from your sins, be delivered from, from the bondage of sin. Uh, which is, gets in the problem with, with drugs and alcohol. Christ will set you free, but you, you have to trust him to do it. And in situations like that, we almost can expect, you know, some relapses now and then, but you will eventually be free. What happens sometimes is people, Christ frees you, and then you go back to it again, and then you find yourself in bondage again. Well, you, you, uh, but... <laughs> The second time, it might take you longer to get out of it as discipline from God. See, he disciplines every child he receives. See, if you, come to, if you think you've come to Christ and you can freely sin and you don't have guilt and the Holy Spirit isn't convicting you of anything, uh, you haven't been saved. The Spirit of God's not in you. <laughs> he won't let you get away with this stuff. Uh, Currently, it says here, uh, he suggested, who is this, Pope Francis, that 50 countries criminalize LBGT people in one way or another, and about 10 have laws carrying the death penalty. Okay, well, as I said, I don't think I would approve of the death penalty. It depends, though. I mean, if you rape a child, I would approve of the death penalty. Uh, anybody that commits rape... I, it, that should be a death penalty offense. It used to be a death penalty offense in many places. Uh, just like murder. Death, murder by Scripture is a death penalty offense. Uh, the, you're talking about matters of civil authority and civil government, and for the purpose of preserving civilization and preserving life, you have to punish those who do things that are corrosive to civilization and corrosive to life and... Uh, if the society goes down that path, the society itself will die. And of course, liberalism doesn't believe in that. So they don't believe in God. So there are uh, obviously the authorities, the government has to work to preserve families and to preserve what is wholesome. How far do you have to go? Well, it sort of depends on the nature of the offense. 
just executing people because they commit certain acts in private, no. No, I would, you know, there's no reason to do that. There's no social need to punish private sin. God will do that. But God's purpose now is to call sinners to repentance. So if God punished all sinners, then everybody would be dead because the wages of sin is death. So uh, he hasn't come in judgment yet. When it comes in judgment, well, that's the, the door of salvation closes then. Then you stand before the judge in your sins if you're not in Christ. So currently 66 UN uh, member nations criminalize consensual same-sex relationships. Okay, it depends on how so. There, there's, you can have laws on the books that you don't actively prosecute except in extreme cases. So society should have laws that we could say are, are standards, but not necessarily uh, seeking to punish everyone as long as it's not done publicly, where it becomes, where the, where the state has to step in because they have to uphold the standard because somebody has been so, uh, in an act of rebellion, say, they, they want to publicly dis display their perversions because they want everybody to accept it. Well, it's not acceptable because it's, it is, uh, it, it causes death in society. It causes rot in society. Uh, it breaks down the very structure. It breaks down the family because the family has to start with a man and a woman married. Uh, there, as far as I'm concerned, uh, having children out of wedlock should be a, a, a crime. How you handle those things, you can handle it in, with mercy, but it, as a public statement of moral order, it should still be a crime. Uh, people that repeatedly have children out of wedlock, you know, there should be, uh, I mean, it, it's, it should be something that should be fined rather than rewarded with welfare payments. So there's, there, there should be a social cost to those who violate certain norms that are serious because they're, they affect stability of the family, and stability, which is the stability of society. It's not because I hate people that I would say that, but because I love them. Uh, and these are necessary. And people that get themselves into these lifestyles, they have to be warned to stay away. There has to be, uh, especially for people that, aren't, that don't belong to Christ, they require some external restraints because they don't have internal restraints. They don't have Christ in you. If Christ is in you, he will discipline you. So the Pope says that's not right. Persons with homosexual tendencies are children of God. That's not what's criminalized. See, this, this is a switcheroo by the big liar called the Pope. He's nothing but a big liar. He is, he's, a, he's a devil, and he demonstrates that, and these other fake Protestant leaders demonstrate that they're uh, complicit with the, 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 well, it's Satan. It's the voice of Satan. Uh, the Pope speaks with the voice of Satan when he does these things. He's deceiving you. See, he, look at the switcheroo. So there's laws against what? Homosexual acts, homosexual behavior. Uh, so it says here, the Pope Francis repeated his view that Catholic Church cannot permit sacramental marriage of same-sex couples, but civil union. Okay, no, that's, see, the issue here, so if you got laws against homosexual, nobody outlaws homosexual tendencies. No, uh, nobody outlaws temptation. The act is outlawed. Laws don't deal with thoughts. Laws don't deal with temptations. Laws deal with acts. 
generally public acts. What you do in your house, out of sight of everybody else, is not really a matter for law. It's what you do in public, things that other people see. And even laws in private, I mean, if, uh, there, are, there are lots of consequences toward physical acts, including spreading diseases. We're not meant for those things. It's contrary to God's word, and it brings judgment. Now, when society embraces it, it brings judgment on society. As with the whole thing with Sodom and Gomorrah was a warning from God that if you go down this route, this is a warning to the world that those that engage in these, these things uh, brings judgment. It brings death. It's a, with a big public warning. Don't do this because this will happen. You Not necessarily fire raining down in the cities, but eternal, eternal fire. And this is not this is this is a sin, but it's not a unique sin. Let's put it that way. It's not uniquely a, a sin. It's a, an abomination. But idolatry is an abomination, and love of money is idolatry. We should criminalize that too. Try to get that through the Congress. You'd, you'd have one hundred percent no votes because they're all lovers of money. Every one of them. I think. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I, if you're not a lover of money and you're in Congress, I apologize to you. Contact me. I'll get. I'll apologize openly. Okay. I'll just, somebody contact me. She said she's not a lover of money. Okay. Okay. Can you prove it? <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll take your word for it. But see, there, there's a switcheroo here. That's not right. So they, they criminalize what? Consensual same-sex relations, relations. That is not, those are physical acts. They're not talking about same-sex friendships. They're talking about same-sex physical relations, as in sexual relations, acts. Is that not true? So the, the, the great potato, the Pope, El Papa, which is the Spanish title. See, what's the difference between El Papa, which is the Spanish for the Pope, and La Papa, which is Spanish for the potato? <laughs> I don't know. Gender? All right, enough for the transgender jokes here. Actually, it's a papal joke. You know, sometimes we need a little humor when dealing with things that are too serious because, I mean, otherwise it's just, if you can't laugh at some of this stuff, if you can't laugh at the Pope, you're taking him way too serious. So homo, uh, persons with homosexual tendencies are children of God. N no. See, the Pope thinks everyone is a child of God. No, it's not. You're not. You're not. Unless you belong to Jesus Christ, you're not a child of God. Unless you're, not, unless you're born again, you're not a child of God. You are a human being. You're not a child of God. Just because you're a human being doesn't mean you're a child of God. You're a sinner. Sinners aren't children of God. People that practice sin are not children of God. People that haven't been born again are not children of God. God loves them. True. God accompanies them. No. Condemning a person like this is a sin. For what? For homosexual tendencies? Probably. Probably. For homosexual acts? No, because God condemns you for that. And then you have the problem of God looks on the heart. So if a person, according to Jesus Christ, should I go there? Yes, I should. Um, let's go there.
See, the, the Pope doesn't care what the Scripture says because he's an Antichrist. Period. I'm going to just say that out loud. He's an Antichrist, a Antichrist. There's many Antichrists because he does not subject himself to the Word of God. He does not serve Jesus Christ. He is a deceiver. He leads people astray, especially Christians. Follow the Pope, and you're on your road to hell, because that's the road he's on. And in a very short time, that's where he will be, uh, because he's passed his expiration date already. Once you get past 80 years old, you're 70 to 80, that's your expiration date. Yeah, uh, sure. You know those the store the cans on the store they have okay until date on. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Human beings, we only last so long, right? It's not a threat. It's just a statement of fact. He's an old man, just like Biden. And if you're an old man, you're going to be standing before your creator before too long. You better make peace with him before you get to that point. Because then it'll be too late. Once you're before the judge, it's too late to make peace with God. You're already on trial. And you will be found guilty. So this is the words of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, Jews and Muslims well, and Christians, please read the words of Jesus. The Matthew, the uh, five, what is it, five, six, and seven, something like that, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's called that because he gave it on a mountain. <laughs> yes, uh, read it. F find out what Jesus Christ actually says because the Quran doesn't tell you what he actually says. This isn't in the Quran. It ought to be in the Quran. But it's in the Injil. So read the Injil. Get a copy of the New Testament. I'm going to say, don't get the Old Testament, get the New Testament. Uh, and if you got an entire Bible, just read the New Testament. You don't need to read the Old Testament. Read the New. I don't want you confused. Read the New. Not that you can't look in the Old, but you need a Christian maybe that's born again to guide you a little bit. Because it's, it's, you've got 66 books there over a period of 1,500 years, 1,600 years written. So sometimes you need a little guidance. If you have questions, you can ask me questions. I'll be happy to answer you according to the best of my ability. Just ask a serious question, I'll give you a serious answer. Come up with some sort of trick question trying to make me look at a, like a fool? Well, maybe I'll let you make me look at, like a fool. I don't really care, but... But uh, I might ignore your question if you're not serious. <laughs> yeah. Like, why does the Bible say the, the, the earth is square or some stupid question like that? That's uh, just, it reveals that you have no one, you're not looking for truth. That you're just trying to be a, a clown. Uh, <laughs> like, really. There's a lot of people on the internet like that. So here... We find the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is, is talking about a particular sin. He's, what is he doing here? The, the Jews, the Pharisees in particular, with their oral traditions, had so distorted the law. And the purpose of the law is to convict us of sin. It's not to give us life because you, you can't. You have to keep it perfectly, all the commandments, all the time, in order to get the blessings of the law and to live eternally, to be, to be saved to, to have eternal life. Perfect obedience is required. Obviously, we've all messed up. <laughs> all of us. The two great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was quoting them from the Torah, the Old Testament, the law of Moses. He didn't make those up. Now, where did Moses get them from? From him. He is the word of God. But it was only temporary. Uh, the, uh, the, the moral aspects, the revelation of right and wrong is not temporary. Uh, some of it's dependent on the circumstances we are, like human beings in mortal bodies. Uh, other things, that, that, that that's where sex takes place. You know, it's not relevant to heaven. In heaven, that we don't have mortal, we're not sexual beings in heaven. We're like the angels in heaven. The angels don't, aren't supposed to engage in that kind of stuff. 
So here he says in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 28, but I say to you, so let me give you a little more context there. You have heard that it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. Well, the, the, the rabbis had perverted this to, to say all kinds of things, including uh, one of the statements of the rabbis, well-known rabbi at that time, was that if a man looks on a woman who he finds more attractive than his wife, it is his duty to divorce his wife and marry the other woman. And they had all kinds of rules that, okay, it's, it's just not wrong. As long as you don't actually commit adultery, it's perfectly fine to lust after women. You know, Things like they were always coming up with ways to get around the commandments, but Jesus is just revealing the true intent of the commandment, the heart of the commandment, what lies underneath the commandment, the foundation. So he says, you have heard it said of, uh, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, Again, he's asserting his authority as God. He said, I say, so this is quoting from the old, this is a quotation from the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You have heard it was said. But Jesus Christ himself is asserting he's greater than Moses. I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Hmm. Why? Because God looks on the heart, not just on the outward act. So God sees your desire. Even if you look on a woman to lust after her, you'd strongly desire her. In other words, if you had the opportunity, you would have sexual relationships with her. So you desire her in a sexual way. Lust. Lust is not simply a, a, you know, she's an attractive woman. She's a beautiful woman. That's not lust. Lust is where you want her, and you would take her if you could. So, so, so they're saying, well, it's only adultery if you actually commit the act. No. Jesus is saying that if you have that desire in your heart, though you refrain yourself from committing the act because you don't want to destroy your marriage, you don't want public disgrace, you don't want to, who knows, any of these are relevant today in the United States at all, but you refrain for some reason other than because you love God, uh, you've still committed adultery. You've, done, you've committed the act in your heart, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's a sin of the heart. So you can sin without actually committing an act. So uh, a, uh, that has to do with homosexual, not homosexual tendencies, but homosexual lust, too. If, if you truly desire to commit an act, but you refrain yourself from doing it, as far as God's concerned, you've already committed the act. But that is not a matter for law and government, because government deals with externals, not internals, okay? But as a Christian, you know, well, you can't do this as a Christian, really. This is something that, uh, but this this idea, homosexual tendency, they're, they're not children of God because they're human beings. Can a Christian have tendencies? Temptations. You're talking about temptations to something. Of course. We all have temptations. Of course. That's not the issue. The, the Pope is doing a switcheroo on you. He's changing acts into ten, temptations, into tendencies. Can you be a genuine Christian and still have temptation? Yes. Yes. Is homosexual temptation a, a mortal sin? No. But if you if you indulge in, in uh, if you indulge in the desire, you indulge in the in the lust. Uh, well, then it, then it is a sin, but it's not unforgivable. You have to go to God with that and say, "God, help me." If you want to do this and persist in that desire, and it's not something you're trying to resist, well, don't call yourself Christian. But uh, the Pope is not a uh, the Pope is a worse guide than Jordan Peterson. I'll be clear about that. He's not someone you should listen to at all uh, because he is not a Christian. He's not a born-again Christian. Otherwise, he wouldn't do what he does. 
he would immediately resign and, and damn the whole system because it is. It's damned by God, condemned by God. He is a, he's an antichrist. He is an op opposer of Jesus Christ and pretends he's a substitute for him. He, he calls himself a vicar of Christ, a substitute for Christ. <clears throat> he's, he's not. He's a usurper. Under a current, <laughs> see, again, the, Pope, the, clan, the church, the Roman Catholic Church says their doctrine never changes. Under current Catholic doctrine, gay relationships are referred to as deviant behavior. Well, they are deviant behavior, but they're also sins that if you live a lifestyle of sin, of, of any kind of willful sin, uh, especially scandalous sin, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you're not a Christian, which means you're not saved. You haven't been born again. Pope Francis has previously said he was worried about the serious matter of homosexuality in the clergy. Well, yes, the, at least half of the clergy, according to Roman Catholic sources, are active practicing homosexuals. Uh, people inside the church have said that re repeatedly, many of them. And there's been some studies. <laughs> it's, this is not a secret thing. But some conservative Catholics have cr questioned him for making comments that they say are ambiguous about sexual morality. Okay. Now, sometimes the church goes way too far. Uh, let me say one thing about divorce. Uh, a person that's divorced in the Roman Catholic Church cannot take communion because it's a, they believe that divorce and remarriage is an ongoing sin. It is not an ongoing sin. The act of being divorced and then marrying someone, you commit an act of adultery. Yes, you do. But under certain circumstances, but that act of adultery breaks the uh, the previous marriage. So you're not in a continual act of adultery. No, that's not what, how it works. An act of adultery does break the covenant of marriage. But it's a covenant of marriage. It doesn't persist after that unless the parties choose to let it persist. Uh, See, because if you if a party commits an act of adultery, the other party is scripturally uh, can divorce. They don't have to, but they can divorce. It's legitimate grounds for divorce. So the idea that a person that is has been divorced and is remarried is committing adultery is simply not true. Especially if they're not the guilty party, they are completely free to marry another. And if they're the guilty party, then they probably need to get saved. <laughs> and it certainly is forgivable. It is certainly forgivable. Adultery is forgivable. It is. But if you have an adulterous lifestyle, if it's an ongoing practice, uh, then you're not saved. You're not in a position. You have never been reconciled with God because you're living in a life in opposition to him. Okay. Uh, well, a homosexual orientation is not sinful, but lustful desires are sinful. So well, let's say you just have a slight attraction that you don't act on, but if you get into serious lustful desires, that is a sin of the heart. Desiring somebody uh, that you would you would like you would, would really like to do it, you know, that is sinful. That is sinful. But that's because of what Christ Christ died for all sins. The all the sins of the entire world. So you could you're, there's forgiveness in Christ. And you, as if you're truly a Christian you can stumble, you can struggle with sin. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. But if you continue to openly live a sinful lifestyle, if you are, have a rebellious heart, uh, you don't care what God says, you don't want to do what's right, you don't want to resist sin, well, then you demonstrate you're not a Christian. So let's go over to a couple of scriptures that talk about this. And this wasn't a subject I was planning to talk about, but, you know, the great potato standing up there and shooting his mouth off about things he doesn't know anything about, uh, does it. 
especially since he's an enemy of Christ. But again, the, this, it's not tendencies. You can be a Christian and have tendencies to various sins. We all do. One, some sins seem to just are more evident than others. Again, like the, the love of money. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of things that be, can become idolatrous in our lives. So we have to be careful to that. that where they, when they start rising above our desire for God, it's, see, an idol is something you love and you serve rather than Christ, rather than God. It's not just a physical thing. So uh, lots of people can do, you know, love all kinds of things and devote themselves to all kinds of things that may not be overtly sinful, but they can become sinful. It's like possessing money is not sinful, but loving money is idolatry. Pursuing money, I mean, make, making that the center of your life. I'm not talking about your the normal desire to have more money or whatever. I'm talking about when that becomes the motive of your life, the desire of your life, the main thing, the thing you serve is money and accumulation of wealth, then you're an idolater, which is an abomination. Uh, idolatry is far more referred to as an abomination, something that is disgusting to God. Is the word what it means. It means something that it's like a stench in his nostrils. Now, God doesn't really have nose, noses, but nose, but you know what I mean. It is, you know, like when you open up that garbage can that's been sitting there too long and you're like, oh, you know, I'm nauseated by it. That's what an abomination is to God. And sexual sins are sinful be, uh, because they aren't consistent with God's purpose in creation. It is a perversion. God made these things good. Sexu sexuality is a gift of God. It is according to the purpose of God. And sexual pleasure is according to the purpose of God, used properly in the proper context. It's when we pervert that and use it outside that context, it becomes sinful. Sex in marriage is not sinful. Unless it's something twisted that's contrary to, to God's purposes. But no, it's not contrary to certain people like so-called St. Augustine. It is not sinful. The sexual act in marriage is not sinful. It is blessed by God. Don't let uh, some of these ideas that have been perpetrated on us over the centuries distort reality, distort God's purpose. It's a good thing, not a bad thing, unless it's not used properly. It's like alcohol. Alcohol often in the Old Testament, is a blessing. Contrary to some, certain Christians that don't read their Bible, <laughs> like certain Baptists that don't read their Bible. You know, they, they never heard that. Of course, they listen to the preacher rather than read the Bible themselves. It's like, if you search on it, you'll find this out. That, but when it's abused, then it becomes bad. Drunkenness, especially habitual drunkenness, uh, be, because it becomes your idol. It becomes that which you serve, uh, especially drugs. Uh, the, so many people, these drug addicts, uh, women, they almost always engage in prostitution. Why? Because they like that? No, it's because their desire for the drug is so strong that they will sell their body to strangers for all kinds of purposes, all kinds of abuse. I know I've carried them into the emergency room over and over and over and over again. Women beaten, just black and blue, because they sold themselves to somebody that wanted rough sex. And they got it. And carrying them into the emergency room is like, mm. So, yeah, I've seen it. I have compassion for them, but I also know what the cause is. And I know the bondage. I had drug problems once upon my, uh, myself. I ended up demon-possessed. And yes, I know about these things. And I feel for people. But we also have to feel for society as a whole because you, you, you don't want to let these things happen to people easily. You, society has to put up some fences to keep people away from some things that are very dangerous, like drug addiction. It's so easy to fall into, and, and sexual perversion will lead you to destruction. 
it will rot you inside your core your soul cannot you're doing things that are contrary to your very nature as a human being it is a a twist uh, the word perversion means a twisting a, it's, a, it's a twist a twisted use of what god has given you as a blessing use sex as a blessing use it in marriage young people get married don't believe this bullshit that you should wait until you're 30. Get married when you're young. When you have all that fire burning in you, that the you know the the hormones raging through you, that is God's way to deal with that. Marriage. Find a good man or a good woman and get married. Normal, God-given. That's what it's for. Fulfill God's purpose. That's part of God's purpose. The idea, the Roman Catholic idea that uh, that celibacy is good is not true. It is not true. If if God has a purpose for you that where that's where he wants you to be, then he will give you the gift of that. If you find yourself troubled by sexual desire and testosterone or something sur uh, surging through your body, well, you haven't been given the gift of celibacy. This Roman Catholic, these Roman Catholic ideas that are promoted by people like Augustine, they are a curse on Christianity, not a blessing. Again, if you're having trouble with the Scripture and understanding certain verses, well, find somebody that knows. Except contact me. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll explain it to you. And, you know, I've, I've served as a pastor, and, you know, I have, I've, I've experienced some of these things. I, not homosexuality, but uh, I can put myself in your shoes, okay? God has given me a certain gift of understanding, and I, I can put myself in your place without actually engaging in things. But, uh, yeah, God has compassion. Jesus Christ became a man— and he understands temptation. He was tempted in various ways, but without sin. He did not sin. Okay, so let's look at another uh, two passages about this issue. Here is uh, warnings from the Apostle Paul. Now, he wants to make it clear, because a lot of people have, the, have, the, have been given the idea that you can, you can sin— you can practice a sinful lifestyle and go to heaven. Some of them, as a fundamentalist Baptist, is called, well, it's, we call it cheap grace. We can look at them. Our Christians look at that. That's not right. The idea that once you've made a decision for Christ or something in itself is not really biblical, that because you did that, because you had a moment of faith, it doesn't matter how you live. Well, it does because how you live indicates whether or not God is in you and he is working in you to conform you to the image of Christ. So if you've been born again, uh, which you must be born again to be saved, you will not live a particular kind of lifestyle that is overtly sinful, scandalously sinful. No, you won't. You may have temptations, you may stumble, you may fall, but you, God will pick you up and you will repent and, and go on, that that will indicate that the Spirit of God is indeed working in you. If you can sin and there's, with impunity and the Holy Spirit does not discipline you and you're just fine with the way you're living, but it's overtly sinful in the eyes of God, well, know that you're not saved. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 9. And again, this is not hate speech, YouTube. This is love speech. One of these days, they're going to try to ban the Bible. But the Bible will ban them if they try it. That's Don't try it, YouTube. It won't be good for you. You're just a corporation. You can be nullified. Destroying a corporation is not murder either. You're not a real being. You're simply a legal fiction. Uh, corporations don't have souls. They're not persons. Don't believe the lies. The corporations are not persons. Do not know, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, who are the unrighteous? Those who do not trust in Christ. The righteous are those who trust in God. 
we are righteous by faith. We're not righteous in and of ourselves because of our sinlessness, but we're righteous in the sight of God because we trust in him. Justified by faith in Christ. To be justified means to be right in the sight of God. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or counted to him for or into righteousness. What does that mean? Abraham was right with God because Abraham believed God. He was a sinner, but he believed God. And because he believed what God had said, he believed what God had promised, God regarded him as right with him. That's what righteous means, right with God. <clears throat> Sometimes it's translated as just, justified. In other words, regarded as, uh, as God, as being right with him, in harmony with him, because you trust in him even though you're not morally perfect. See, that's not the issue. It's not The issue is not your sins per se, but your relationship with God. I mean, Christ died on the cross atoning for the sins of the entire world. They're already atoned for in Christ. So if you're in the right relationship with him, you don't have to worry about your sins as far as your relationship with God, but if you're in that relationship, you're born again, and then God is at work in you, and he will change your desires, he will write his commandments in your heart, and he will set you free from bondage to sin. You won't be a slave to it. Again, at times, temptation, times of weakness, Satan waits for an opportune time, and he'll throw something at you, and you might fall. But that you know, doesn't mean you're fallen so far that you're you're dead, you're perished. Don't believe Roman Catholic doctrine; it's wrong. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. All right. Let me point out, let's see, make sure I'm right before I open my mouth. Uh, let's, I'm going to look at the form of these words here just briefly. These are nouns. Okay. Uh, these, these words here, let me get back because now I've interrupted myself. These are nouns that describe a person. These are not nouns that describe an act. So these are persons that habitually practice these things. These are not people, when you're talking about fornicators and idolaters and uh, adulterers and homosexuals and sodomites and thieves and covetous, uh, contrary to certain people that misuse the Bible, when it's talking about, for example, a thief, this does not mean you're not a thief because you one time stole something. Yes, that was a sin. But a thief, in the biblical sense, the way it's used in the Bible, is a person who practices theft, who is habitual th theft. Perhaps it is their lifestyle. They are a thief by profession, if you know what I mean. So a fornicator is somebody that habitually practices fornication, which is any unlawful sexual behavior. In other words, this is a cat a catch-all uh, phrase for uh, immoral sex. It is adultery, homosexuality, uh, uh, sexual relationships outside a marriage covenant. All these things, uh, all kinds of sexual sins, are cover, cover uh, come under the word of pornea. Uh, so that is uh, uh, a uh, a, homo a a prostitute is a porne. 
It's a woman who practices fornication for a living. That's a good example of what this is being referred to here. You don't have to do it for a living, but I mean, this is an ongoing pattern in their lives. This is not, again, a one-time thing or something that is inconsistent with your life, but rather things that are consistent with your life. There are descriptions of these people, their practices. So I want to clarify that. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Now, and included there is not fornicators, again, sexual, the sexually immoral in a broad uh, category, uh, idolaters, people that that worship idols or worship things other than God, including the love of money is explicitly called uh, idolatry. This is serious love of money. I mean, this is what you're living for. Again, these are lifetime things. So people that pursue money as that's their lifetime, that's what they do, that's what they're all about. That, yeah, they're an idolater. People that devote themselves to all kinds of things, devote, devote themselves to sports as their lifetime. That sports has become their idol. It's, it's what they worship. It is what they serve. It is what they live for. Uh, adulterers, same thing. Again, this year, more specific sexual sins. This is breaking a marriage covenant, either as uh, somebody else's marriage covenant or your own. A, a porn, a, a prostitute commits adultery when she has sexual relationships with a married man. And she, he becomes an adulterer. She is breaking that covenant. She is a party to the act of adultery. Uh, nor homosexuals. Uh, uh, okay, this is uh, this is the uh, referring explicitly. Uh, Malakos is referring specifically to a homosexual that is say enough the man the effeminate man that takes the submissive role it's quite explicit uh breakdown on sexual sins here uh or sodomites uh, uh arsenocoitus this is actually a word that apparently paul coined from uh, uh, two greek words that refers explicitly to uh Two men having sexual relationships in bed, a to to of course in uh, English language uh, an old expression was to bed someone. In other words, to take them to bed for the purpose of sexual relationships. Uh, it was a just a common expression for that. Now here, our our senocoitus is literally. Where is that word here again? The word is translated here in the uh, New King James as sodomite, but what it really refers to is a man who takes a man to bed the way he would take a woman to bed. So it's a uh, two men engaging in sexual intercourse where that in a very specific way, if you know what I mean. <laughs> if you don't what I mean, uh, know what I mean, I don't want to explain it to you. Um, it is what is legally, it used to be illegally called sodomy, an act of sodomy. Uh, <clears throat> but again, the, he, he coined a word here that literally means man better. Arseno is male, and coitus is uh, uh, to bed, again, in a sexual way. Uh, so, what did he say? Nor thieves? Again, that's a, there was a number of uh, words about uh, fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, and sodomites. These are not separated in different categories. I mean, as far as is priority. They're all sinful lifestyles, people that practice these things. Again, practice them. I want to make it clear that the way that language actually is used here. Thieves, people that practice theft. When you talk about thieves in the Bible, you're talking about somebody who practices theft. You're not talking about somebody who is 
ever stolen anything. I mean, that's not what it means. It means someone who makes a practice of it. Covetous, people that are by practice covetous. They desire what belongs to others. Drunkards, people that practice drunkenness. It doesn't mean somebody that went to to the, the marriage feast that Jesus went to, and Jesus made 80 gallons of alcoholic wine, and they got a little bit tipsy. You were supposed to get a little tipsy. That was part of the celebration. The, the Bible does not, when it talks about drunkenness, it, especially a drunkard, it means a, drunk, a drunkenness as in incapacitated, like vomiting. <laughs> It, uh, this is not, uh, of course, you shouldn't be drinking and then driving, but they didn't have that issue then. Um, if you fell off your donkey, that was, okay, big deal, you know. But that was your fault. But you were, you go out there, that, you weren't being a danger to other people. Drunk driving laws happen to, uh, have to do with being a danger to the other, others. And if you, if you, uh, are doing things that makes you a danger to the others, then that's obviously sinful. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You can't fulfill the commandment of God by drinking and then getting in your car and driving. You're not being mindful about the welfare of others. If you can't, if you're taking prescription drugs and they affect your ability to drive your vehicle, you ought not be driving. Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, all the commandments go back to those two, loving God and loving your neighbor. You don't act contrary to God's purpose of creating you, and you don't do things that endanger, especially endanger others or hurt others. Now, all these things affect others. They're not private sins. It doesn't mean affect whether it's, uh, even if it's consensual, consensual doesn't make it right with God. I mean, you're doing something to others. If you're committing an act of sodomy with another man, you're doing something that could kill him. You could give him AIDS. You could give him all kinds of diseases. You could cause him to bleed to death. You could physically damage him. You're not made for that. And if you're engaging in that, you're not loving your neighbor. You're doing it for selfishness. You're doing it for your own physical gratification, period. And the other guy's doing it for the same thing. You are not engaging in an act that's blessed by God, period. It's sinful. God didn't design you for that. Satisfy your sexual desires inside a covenant of marriage. They're for that. They're blessed there. That's the only place that... Sexual activity is blessed and beneficial and healthy is inside a marriage covenant. Again, fornicators is outside of a marriage country. A man living with a woman outside of marriage, outside of a covenant with God that doesn't have that commitment to one another, that lifelong commitment is supposed to be lifelong. Doesn't, doesn't always that way, but that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the only place sex is blessed. And it's right and it's proper. Don't get a guilt conflict uh, problem over it because, because of the Catholic Church. It's blessed by God. It's the Catholic Church that's not blessed by God. And their, and their, priest, their, their uh, so-called celibate priesthood is not blessed by God. Celibacy is not better. Celibacy is a deviation from God's created purpose. It may be... Um, okay under certain circumstances, but normal, God's normal plan is for one man to marry one woman and have a family. That is what is blessed by God. That is the more blessed state than trying to live single. There may be circumstances for God's purposes where that is better because you don't have to be concerned about a wife and child. You're going in a dangerous place, for example. Uh, preaching the gospel in some places may be dangerous. You might not want a, man, a wife and children with you. Uh, but in general, that's not the way you should go. You should go as a husband with a wife and with children, like everybody else in the world is supposed to be living. 
So what about this? Yeah, covetous, drunkards, revilers, um, railers. That's uh, people that are just, well, mouthy, obnoxious. Extortioners. That's a form of theft in a way. Rapacious. In other words, people that, that are grabbing up other people's stuff and it's not done justly taking other people's property or trying to extort from them or everything. You're not acting justly toward them. You're not loving your neighbor as yourself. You're not doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. All these things, uh, and these again are characteristics of people. This is what they commonly practice. It is not simply a person that does that sins once in a while. Uh, doesn't really want to do it. They feel guilty about it, but they did it. They were tempted, and that's not what this is talking about. So when he says that, those people shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you'll be judged by God as sinful. You'll be judged by God. And that what you'll be judged for is not believing in Christ. If you believe in Christ, he will set you free from these lifestyles. So when the Catholic Church tries to, to, to uh, cover over the issue, and try to get people to, to come to church but live together and tells them they're okay with God when they're engaging in lifestyles that are not okay with God that indicate they're actually not saved. They're still in their sins. They're still wallowing in the mud of sin. They are not serving God at all, but they're serving Satan. So you, you need to be told the truth. If somebody tells you a lie and says you're okay with God when you're not, and I've run into this so many times uh, among prostitutes on the street, they're often Catholics. And at least the ones in the neighborhood I was in, in the, 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 the bookstore, they, I, I ran into several that said, well, I'm just, I'm right with God. I remember one that called me up on the phone one time and she wanted me to pay her rent because her roommate who was a prostitute they were both drug addicts had used all her drugs and she didn't have the money to buy drugs so she spent her her rent money on drugs and she wanted me to pay her rent it's like and i i said your problem is not your rent your problem is that you're a prostitute and you no, i said your you need to get right with god your relationship with god is your problem and she was irate she was just, and she said, she, I'm a Catholic. I have a perfectly fine relationship with God. And this isn't the only one I had to say this to, but no, you're not. You are a prostitute and you're a drug addict. You have a terrible relationship with God. See, but the Catholic Church was telling her she was fine. Oh, I go to confession. Well, da, 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 da. It, you're still a prostitute and drug addict. You're still in your sins. You're still living as a sinful life, a sinful lifestyle. You're not saved. You haven't been delivered. You don't know Jesus Christ. See, the Catholic Church has no power at all otherwise to save people from their sins. They demonstrate it. Their priests are in bondage to homosexuality and pedophilia and everything else. The Catholic Church can't deliver their own priests. The priests can't deliver themselves. What power do they have? Why should you go there? They don't demonstrate any power to save anybody from anything. Don't listen to the great potato. He's nothing but a potato head. Talk about an idol. You, get, you remember the, the Mr. Potato? Take a potato and you stick some plastic legs on him and some plastic arms and plastic eyes and plastic mouth. It's an idol. It's the Pope. El Potato. El Papa. With gender confusion, El Papa. La Papa. So, but, verse 11 here. And such were, past tense, some of you. Such were, some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. See, he said, some, some of these, these are, describe your lifestyle. Some of you had lifestyles. Some of you were homosexuals. Some of you were thieves. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you lived lives of covetousness and idolatry. 
Some of you were extortioners. But what? But you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. They had been saved from this. They no longer practice these things because of God's power working in them. They were delivered from their sinful lifestyles through faith in Jesus Christ. God delivered them because they believed in Christ. That's what Christianity is, real Christianity. God saves you. Again, you can stumble, you can fall. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about being delivered from these lives of sin. We all come to God in the same condition, sinners that need God's Savior, need God's salvation, need God's forgiveness. God gives it to us. It doesn't matter what the sin is particularly. You're in bondage to sin. You're not right with God. But we're right with God through faith in Christ. And it is God who cleans us up. You don't have to put away your sins before you come to Christ. You come to Christ as you are, desiring for him to save you from your sins, for him to forgive you, to him, for him to make you what he wants you to be. You put yourself in his hands. You don't try to make yourself right. You let him make you right. Not because we're not saved by works, not what by we do, but by what God does in us. That's his promise, that he will transform us. He will forgive us and transform us and put his spirit in us, change our hearts. But again, we still live in this mortal body. Paul has an entire chapter about that. How come I keep doing things I don't want to do? Well, he writes about that. So uh, let's see, is there another? Where am I on time? Uh, way beyond where it should be. Way beyond. That's all right. There's no limit at YouTube. Let's see if they swallow this video or not. No, that's not where I want to be. Okay, so that that's uh, that's enough then. Uh, so again, again, the, the don't listen to Francis. You don't need the Catholic Church. You don't need the Protestant Church. You need Jesus. True Christianity is a personal relationship with God. It is being reconciled to God. See, God did everything already that's necessary for you being reconciled to him. He already sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of the entire world and then raised him from the dead as proof that he accomplished that atonement, that your sins have been forgiven in him on the cross. He died for the sins of the whole world. An innocent man died on the cross, laid down his life, shed his blood. See, the, the wages of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death. Christ died for us. He paid the penalty. Now, when you come to him, you, you enter into that relationship with him where that applies to you. His death applies to you because you're in him. Through faith in him, we're saved. We're forgiven. We enter into the blessings of God. We're made right in God's sight through faith because we're in Christ. We become the inheritors of the promises of the new covenant and even the blessings of the law because Christ kept the law. All those things are ours. We, th we are joint heirs with Christ. We inherit the kingdom of God. We inherit all things in him if we're in him by faith. And he delivers us from our sins. Again, we're still in these bodies. We're not, we have not experienced the redemption of our body, the absolute freedom of sin, which we will experience when he comes. Soon. It has to be soon. This world ain't going to survive very long, the way things are going. He'll come and cut it short. He won't allow a full-scale nuclear exchange to happen. He's going to cut it short or no flesh, no human beings, no mortal human beings would survive. God will cut it short. Christ will come before that happens to stop that from taking place. He promises. Jesus Christ himself said that. So uh, it's his promise. God's word cannot be broken. Now, again, this is, uh, uh, as Jesus said of the Pharisees, he said they're blind guides. 
The same thing is true of the Roman Catholic Church, the establishment, the, 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 uh, the pope and his bishops. Uh, some of them aren't quite as bad as others, but nevertheless, the whole system is corrupt. The whole system teaches false doctrine. You don't need the Catholic Church. You don't need her rituals. You don't need her sacraments. You need Jesus Christ and him alone. Muslims or uh, Jews or whatever, you don't have to come join one of these things. You need to be joined to Jesus Christ through faith. And God will guide you as far as what you should do. He, he guides his children. He teaches us. He leads us. Again, true Christianity is a relationship with God in Christ, who is both man and God. He is the, he is the connection between humanity and God. You can know God in him. We don't know him perfectly yet, but when he comes, we will see him as he is, Christ as he truly is, and we'll be like him. There is a, in Jesus Christ, on earth, in his physical body, there was a, a joining together of God and man. He is both. Uh, they're not mixed exactly, but they are, he is both God and man, and because of that, he is also the judge of the world. He purchased all of humanity on the cross, purchased us out from under the curse of sin and death, and we belong to him, and we will be judged by him on our relationship to him and how we treated his people, too. So if, if you don't know him and when he returns, but you have treated those who belong to him well, well, then he regards you as just because of the way you will respond to us because he dwells in us. So he said, well, they, they say, well, when did we ever see you hungry? When did we ever see you, see you naked? When did you, we ever see you in jail? And Jesus said, as much as you've done it to these, his people, you've done the same thing to me because he's in us. In a way that's often we ourselves are not terribly aware of, but it's true because God says so. So that is uh, what I have to say about uh, the great potato and what he says about things. Don't listen to him. He doesn't belong to God. He's not a Christian. He's not born again. If he was, he wouldn't be what he is. So, uh, well, Mr. Potato Head over here is not someone to follow. He does not represent Jesus Christ. If you are anti-Christian because of this man, well, know that he is not Jesus. And Jesus' attitude towards sinners is he receives them. He's willing to receive anyone that's willing to come to him. You come as you are. You don't try to clean up your life first. You leave that to God. He's able to do it much better than you are. But you must come, and uh, I'm going to say it this way. To receive him is to accept who he is, but it also means we have to cast ourselves into God's hands, which is a, to be a little bit scary. I'm talking personal experience, but because you don't know. You don't know him yet, and it's a little bit frightening to put yourself in the hands of God, <laughs> especially as a sinner, because you don't know yet what he's going to do. I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to forgive you. And all of a sudden, you will know that Christ died for your sins. You'll, you'll have a God-given faith that you know for certain. Your sins are paid for. They were paid for on the cross. All your sins, past, present, and future. They're paid for already. They were paid for 2,000 years ago. You don't have to worry about that. And you're right with God because of faith in Christ. The one you know did this for you. That you're right because of that not because of your works, not because of your deeds. So you don't have to really worry about that. But then God puts his desires in you, and you want to do what God wants you to do. Again, we fail often, but we have that desire in, in us to do what is right in the sight of God. He puts it there. And he's in, in us himself. So it's a matter of a communion with God. It's a matter of being his children. You don't spend your life as a child of your father worrying about whether I am his child or not. You know you are. When you do wrong, you know you might get a whooping, 
But that's it. What? But a good father disciplines his children for children for their own benefit, not because they're angry, not because they enjoy inflicting pain, but because they they want the, what is best for their children. And God knows what is best. Human fathers, we fail often because we're ignorant and human. And but God is not ignorant and human. Uh, he, he's beyond that, and he knows what is truly good, and he loves us so much that he sent his son, his only begotten son. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us in order to die on that cross for the sins of the world. And he proved it by Jesus raising from the dead. That is the proof God has given to all humanity that Jesus is the Messiah, the one sent as Savior and will come again as judge. So he is what Christianity is. Everything else is dispensable. Jesus is the in indispensable. He is, to be in that relationship with him, is what it means to be a Christian. You can throw everything else away, really. Everything else is noise. If you're in a relationship with him, he will arrange the other stuff. He will give you the love for the brethren, for other Christians. It will be divine love in you. And he will be the one that works to sanctify you, to set you apart to him. And it takes place, usually not instantly, but over a period of time, according to his will, as we learn to trust him. It's really all about trusting God. It's not more complicated than that. Trust him, and you're right with him. Trust Christ. It's not trusting a different God. It's the God who has revealed himself uh, perfectly in Jesus Christ. He that has seen him has seen the Father. Jesus said, so you want to know what God is like? Read the Gospels. See what Jesus Christ is like, because that's how God the Father is also, because he's of the Father. He has seen him. Christ has seen the Father. So I hope that's helpful for some of you out there. And if any of you out there may not currently be Christians, I hope you have now a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian, a better understanding of Christ, and a better understanding of why you shouldn't listen to some of the people who call themselves Christians that have been around for way too long like Roman Catholicism, some of these institutions, because they do not represent him. And Rome, of course, was responsible for the Crusades. Well, some of them were, in a way, provoked. There was a little bit of wrongdoing on both sides, but the Crusades are not, were not, sent by Jesus Christ. They are the work of sinful man, the popes and his agents, uh, riling people up with hatred and lust for riches. The Crusades demonstrated what they really were because they even sacked Christian cities and plundered them. They were not of God at all, especially they regarded uh, the Orthodox of the East as heretics and plundered and murdered them too, demonstrating that they were of their father, the devil, not of Christ. God was not their father at all.